Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Leslie Jane Seymour. Good afternoon. So glad to be here. Today I have the honor of moderating a panel of three unbelievably incredible women. But first, I have the challenge of introducing the woman who needs no introduction. So I will tell you a story about her instead. When she decided to make history by being the first first lady to edit, to guest edit a magazine, she did so with the requirement that the project be with purpose. And that's why I call her the first lady of purpose. Now, when it comes to magazines, purpose can have a whole range of meanings. There's the purpose of a great fashion spread, which is to get all of us to go out and ante up for a great pair of shoes. There's the purpose of a humor piece, which is to allow a reader to laugh and take a break from that mile a minute lifestyle and all the demands he or she has. But there's another kind of purpose as well. There's the investigative piece that exposes corruption or fraud in a town or business. There is the breakthrough health story that a reader rips out and gives to her doctor to enlighten him or her about a new treatment that ends up saving her life. To our guest editor, purpose means mission-driven. And the issue she created for us highlighted all of her missions helping veterans through joining forces, helping young Americans seek higher education with Reach Higher, helping and inspiring a healthier generation through Let's Move. But it wasn't until I hopped on a plane and traveled halfway around the world to watch her launch her newest program, Let Girls Learn, that I really understood what purpose means to her. We were in a stifling hot room in Cambodia in a classroom in a, in a building with a dozen young girls who stood and spoke of their determination to get an education, of waking up at 4 a.m. to prepare the family's rice and milk the cows, and then walking two hours to get to school. She hugged each of them and said, quote, there are going to be people who aren't going to be happy that you're so smart and strong and capable. It happened to me when I was your age. There were people who told me that I wasn't smart enough to go to college or to law school. But I ignored them, and I want you to ignore them too. Now here's a short video that showcases the mission and purpose of Let Girls Learn. I come from Matadi. I drive from school because I want to get no support. Mama not living, and my partner here to send me to school. 62 million girls around the world who should be in school are not. That's not by accident. It's the direct result of barriers, large and small, that stand in the way of girls who want to learn. We often focus on the economic barriers girls face, school fees or, or uniforms, or how they live miles from the nearest school and have no safe transportation. It's also about attitudes and beliefs. It's about whether societies cling to laws and traditions that oppress women. We know that when girls are educated, they're more likely to delay marriage. Their future children, as a consequence, are more likely to be healthy. Their future wages increase, which in turn strengthens the security of their family. And national growth gets a boost as well. And that is why the United States government recently launched a new global girls education effort called Let Girls Learn. As part of this initiative, U.S. Peace Corps volunteers will work side by side with local leaders, families, and girls themselves to help girls go to school and stay in school. They'll be creating mentoring programs, girls' leadership camps, and so much more.
Girl empowerment is for a girl to be able to have the self-esteem and really the confidence to be able to feel like they can do anything they put their mind to. I will go to school again to achieve something in my life. Every child is precious, every girl is precious. Every girl deserves an education. Let girls learn. So, so today our panelists will be talking to us about, surprise, media with purpose, especially as it relates to Let Girls Learn. In honor of that mission, AMMC is proud to announce that Meredith, Time Inc., Hearst, and Condé Nast have joined forces to offer Let Girls Learn over $9 million worth of free PSAs, which will run in the October issues of all their magazines to coincide with the International Day of the Girl on October 11th. In addition, the four companies have contributed to the Peace Corps Let Girls Learn Fund. And you can help make a difference, too, by donating to the fund if you'd like to. You can text Let Girls Learn, your pledge amount, and your name to 56512 today. Or you can visit donate.peacecorps.gov. And you'll find all the details on your table if you'd like to join us. Our second panelist has been called the face of millennial feminism. Through her HBO series, Girls, her New York Times bestseller, Not That Kind of Girl, social media and her twice weekly newsletter, Lenny Letter, she encourages women to feel and act more empowered. She regularly tackles issues such as the wage gap, parent, Planned Parenthood, same-sex marriage, and national politics. She's also learned to navigate the dark side of media, withstanding internet hate, for freely showing her curvy, gorgeous body and speaking out for social justice. Last fall, our third panelist launched Everyday, Everytown Creative Council, which includes 80 plus members of the entertainment community, including Reese Witherspoon and Ellen DeGeneres. They're shining a spotlight on gun violence and how to prevent it. As an in-demand cover celebrity, she uses her interviews as well as YouTube, Twitter, and social media to send a strong message about the importance of gun safety. Many of her films have also hit on timely issues. In Still Alice, she played a professor with early onset Alzheimer's, a performance that earned her an Oscar in 2015. So, ladies and gentlemen, I now give you the First Lady of the United States, Michelle Obama. And Le Lena Dunham. And, and Julianne Moore. And just, be just before we get the panel started, I want to acknowledge our 20 fabulous girls in the front row from the Young Women's Leadership Schools of Jamaica and Astoria, Queens. This way. All right, ladies. Okay, let's Hi. rock today. Hi. We're going to have fun. Okie doke. Hi, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much for coming. We're so excited. Everybody here is thrilled to have you. I have to see what I'm saying here. So let's start with you, Mrs. Obama. Okay, as a guest editor of More Magazine last year, the magazine focused a lot on your latest initiative, Let Girls Learn. And we did an event for Let Girls Learn in DC as well. 
Why did you choose a magazine, since these are all magazine executives out here, as your vehicle, and why in particular for this initiative? Well, uh, magazines are still the best vehicle to tell a detailed, long story, you know, to really go in depth and paint a, pinch, a picture. And when we launched Let Girls Learn, it was important for us to make sure that people understood the issue uh, and that we could engage readers to take action. So what better partner than More Magazine? Um, you know, we were just so thrilled that you were willing to invest the time and the space and the energy to tell that story. And not just to put it in your magazine, but Leslie, you traveled with me to Cambodia. <laughs> yes. That's dedication. Oh yeah, that was good. And you got to see firsthand the, the, the struggles that many of these girls are facing. And you talked about those in your speech. You all saw that in the video. 62 million girls today are not in school and the consequences are devastating. The girls who aren't educated have higher rates of HIV. Uh, they have higher rates of infant mortality. They have uh, lower wages. Um, this impacts not just the individual girls, but their families, their communities, and an entire nation. And you did such an excellent job in painting that picture because you were on the ground and you could make that investment. So now, because of that story, because of the articles you wrote, because of that issue, we have a place to drive people to action. Yeah. They have the sub substance. They have the comprehensive message. Right. So now we can partner with social me media to do the driving piece to create that buzz. But it's helpful to have something for them to go to. So if we want these young girls to get involved by using the hashtag 62 million girls, they can go back to the more piece and really go in depth. You can't do that with uh, uh, limited characters or with a six second Vine video. Only magazines can really make that happen. So we're grateful. And we had a lot of fun doing it. So we, we did have a lot of fun. We had a really good time. Our, our, our teams work well together and you know, we're just so grateful uh, to be able to, to highlight this issue. Good, and, we, and I felt it was wonderful to have, for you to have an actual archive Absolutely. of what you, what you felt. And again, it's something you can keep on your table, you can pass along to your kids. Can you just mention that when you knew when you had success when your mom read it? That was the, oh yeah. this oh, is yeah. really funny. My mom doesn't pay attention to anything I do. <laughs> <laughs> it's really sad. She still loves my brother more. <laughs> But I'm okay, I'm getting over it. <laughs> but when she said, you're on the cover of more? And she actually took the magazine up to her room and she read every word, every single word. So that just tells you the power of the magazine to really reach readers in an in-depth in -depth way, something she hasn't done in a while. She doesn't read my speeches, she doesn't look at my clips. That's she, how we knew we she did She read good. more. We did, that's how we knew we did good is when we heard that her mom ran upstairs, read it, came downstairs and said it's great. And then we all breathed a sigh of relief. We were actually happy. Can you talk just briefly about how is an American, you know, when I look at a, getting a girl at, in school in Cambodia, how does that affect me? Why should I care? Why does that matter to my life? Because you actually have facts and figures that it does. Yeah, well, the president drew on it. I mean, you know, girls who are educated, you know, they, they earn more money, they raise healthier families. You know, some studies show that for every extra year of secondary education that a girl gets, that increases her earning pot potential by as much as 15%. Um, so this isn't just good for this country. I mean, we have more educated, empowered people in the world buying products and producing goods and spending resources and traveling and learning, that's gonna impact our economy as well. Uh, one of the reasons why I like to have young girls at the events that we do around Let, Let Girls Learn is because I want them to be inspired as well. And I want, I want girls here and young people broadly in the United States to really understand this issue because a lot of times here we take our education for granted because it's so accessible here. We're blessed to live in a country where kids have access to school. And it's important for these kids to know that there are girls who would give anything to trade places uh, with the kids in this country. So we wanna make sure that they're empowered to take advantage of the resources that they have and that they get their education 
and, and develop the skills so that they can be part of making change for these 62 million girls. This is about all of our lives. Okay, young ladies? <laughs> <laughs> I think there, uh, from what I heard backstage when you were taking pictures, there are 20, 20 sets of hands that are not getting washed ever again. So Well, you have to wash your hands. There's going to be a problem. They're going to wash their hands because all their nails are really nice. Okay. So they're going to keep their hands clean. <laughs> so Julianne and Lena, um, we all know that education is a foundation for all of us in what we do. Can you talk a little bit about how your respective educations have shaped you and how it's given you a voice to speak out? Who wants to jump in? We'll start. Okay, <laughs> Lena. I grew up right here in New York City and was very, very lucky to have a, um, there's both great public and private education options in New York. I happened to go to a private school that was very focused on the arts and focused on alternative ways of learning. So I went to a school in Brooklyn called St. Anne's that um, allowed me in high school to be taking poetry class, to be, you know, the head of the student-directed plays program, to be, you know, creating literary magazines and starting our own newspaper. And there was a real um, sense at our school that it was not only an option, but our obligation to create sort of institutions that would benefit us and benefit other students. And we also didn't get grades there, which is either Ooh. a great or a terrible thing, depending on... I mean, it can, it's great when you're in high school. It's confusing when you get to college. Right. And, and then I um, spent my college career at um, Oberlin College in Ohio, which is a school that I'm really proud to have graduated from. It was um, the first school in America to admit both um, women and people of color, and that's a really great legacy, to, and it has an incredibly progressive agenda, and the motto of the school is learning and labor, so really encouraging people to both take their education seriously and also to make um, volunteerism and activism a part of their education on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think those two, and I did get grades there, and I'm not uh -huh. going to say they were always fabulous, but <laughs> I think those two programs in tandem were incredible, and I feel really lucky because I talked to so many people who's, who felt like their education actually wasn't a formative part of. They didn't have close relationships with teachers. They didn't feel connected to what they were doing. And I was lucky enough to go to two schools where I felt an extreme sense of loyalty and purpose to the institution. And, um, and I also want to say I was something that's come to my attention in recent years is I was very lucky that I was able to have um, parents who were able to pay for my education. And mm -hmm. so I left school without student debt. And wow. so that is a very rare and blessed position to be in, and so it's very important to me to um, talk about ways that we can alleviate the barriers that stand between women and education so that your education isn't something you carry with you on your back every single day for the rest of your life. Right. Yep. Julianne, you, um, you moved around a lot, so you I were the did. new kid. Your dad was My in the army. My in the army, so I went to public schools all over the United States and then eventually in Germany. My parents really valued education because they didn't get their college degrees until after the three of us were born. My father was oh. out of Vietnam. So they subsequently both got their, my father got a law degree and my mother got two masters. And so for them, that, the idea was that we were all going to be we we're all going to have higher education. We're going to go to college, we're going to graduate school. And it wasn't, I wouldn't be an actor, however, if I didn't have a teacher in Germany, an English teacher, tell me that I should be an actor, which was anathema to me because I'd never seen a play. I'd never wow. met a real actor. I only watched TV and movies and seemed very, very far away. But she said to me when I was 16, I think you could do this, and here are some schools that you can apply to. And I went home to my parents and said, I'm going to be an actress. <laughs> <laughs> and they cried, and right? They <laughs> but to their credit, they said, okay, you can, uh, you can go to college for acting, but it has to be a college, not a conservatory, because you must have a degree. Because if it doesn't work out, you should be able to go to graduate school or pursue something else. But so with that in mind, with that idea that, uh, what was interesting was having a teacher acknowledge that there was something that I could do that she'd seen. I mean, that was transformative. Um, and that happened in a public school system when I was 16 years old. I read something later on that said that that's what, sometimes that's what kids need to achieve. They need an adult outside of the family member to acknowledge them, to, to recognize them, to see what they can do and encourage them. 
And, and that's what happens in education. And that's what makes you develop. That's what makes you become the person that you eventually are. And if that doesn't happen, if you don't have that opportunity, if you don't live in a community where people don't see you, you, you don't grow, you don't develop. Mrs. Obama, do you want to say something about that? Because you talk a lot about, you know, reaching out and changing people's lives and someone acknowledging you mm. when you were very young. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I grew up uh, like Julianne, but we didn't travel. My parents were working class folks. They didn't go to college. Um, but there was something about their upbringing that knew that, that where they knew that college was an, an expectation. It was a must do, even though it wasn't something that they achieved. Um, but I didn't always get that encouragement um, because there were some teachers that I uh, ran into who doubted that a girl like me, a black girl from the south side of Chicago, should apply to Princeton or could get into Harvard. Um, and that's a lot of times what these girls that we talk about face. You know, they face a lot of cultural barriers. Maybe those barriers are coming from within their own families, within their own communities, where somebody's telling them that girls shouldn't get an education, that you should stay home and work and uh, get married early and take care of your family, or that you're not smart enough or that you're not good enough to get an education. Um, but as I told the girls in Cambodia, our job is to push past those doubters and to find those caring adults that see the positive in us because they are out there. Because for all the people that told me I, I couldn't do it, I had parents who believed deeply in my ability to do whatever I wanted to do. I had a big brother who thought I was awesome, even though my mother loves him better than me. It's okay, <laughs> though. I still like him. Um, but we all, as young women, we have to find those people in our lives and grasp on those positive messages and put the doubters out of our mind. Um, and then when we do achieve, we have to reach back and help others um, because whatever drove you to succeed, you've gotta help another young person in your life find that for herself. Uh, and if we do that, we, we will not lose the potential of all these girls who go uneducated. We've got too many problems in the world. Uh, to let half of our population go without the skills and development they need to contribute. You know, you guys are going to be the next movers and shakers, the people who are going to solve climate change, who are going to deal with terrorism, who are going to deal with poverty and hunger. Um, and we need you smart and ready and confident in your abilities. And we need girls around the world to all have that opportunity so that they can be sitting here like the three of us uh, talking about all that we've achieved. Yay. All right, so we'll get to the topic at hand, which is media with purpose. So we'll start with Mrs. Obama. When you agreed to be the guest editor of MORE, and, or when you sit down with YouTube sensation Michelle Fan, who was with us in Japan, or you agree to be part of an episode of Project Runway Junior to lift girls up, how do you make that decision and why? And we really think about the audience that we're trying to reach. It's, it's simple. <laughs> who, do we, who are we trying to get our message to? And oftentimes, we're trying to talk to young people. Uh, and as a mom living with two generation Zers, I think that's what you all are called, your Zers, um, teens with an attitude. Um, I've got two of them in my house. So <laughs> I know that the way they take in the world is very different from the way I did growing up. I mean, they're on their phones and they're, you know, what, what, what's this called? Swiping? Scrolling. Scrolling. Scroll, it's, yeah. I think it's swiping. Swiping, Leslie. sorry. That's Swip, old, swiping. old speak. You don't scroll, you swipe. They're swiping and they're sharing <laughs> vines and they're laughing at stuff on their phones. They're not watching the evening news. They're not reading the New York Times. No offense, but they're not. So, you know, we have to try to reach them where they are. Um, so we find the programs and the people and the role models that they look up to and we engage. Um, so... And dealing with that particular audience, we have to be nimble. We can't just do what was traditionally done. Mm -hmm. We have to figure out if we really want kids to engage in these issues, if we really want young girls in the United States to care about their education and eat better and be more active, we have to talk to them where they are. Um, and they are talking to Michelle Fan. Yeah. And they may be looking at how she does makeup, but if she turns her platform into something positive, which she understood, they're going to start listening to her on other issues as well. Yep. So we're with Michelle Fan, you know? Mm -hmm. So 
everything is fair game uh, if, if you really want to be effective in getting your message across, particularly if you want to uh, attract young people. And Lena, do you want to talk a little bit about, there is a tsunami of media out there. There are magazines, newspapers, every single channel you could imagine, YouTube. Why would you start a newsletter? It's a great question and one I ask myself every day. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a great newsletter, by the way, I have to tell you. I love it. It's very literary. It's fabulous. Thank you very much and we really appreciate it and it's been a real learning experience. I have an incredible staff that works with me. Um, most of them are women under 30 who are far savvier than me about what's happening on the internet. And, you know, I think Mrs. Obama said it best when she said that there are certain things that you can't express in the in, within the character limitations of Twitter, and you can't expect there to be a healthy dialogue that takes place um, in that kind of finite form. And something that was really important to me was that I know as a younger woman, I'm now approaching 30, but in my early 20s, I felt very disinformed. You're still young. <laughs> Babies. Like, what, what? She's not 30. I feel like <laughs> deeply aged, but thank you for reminding me. But I know that politics for me, I felt very disenfranchised, and it was really hard for me to sift through media and understand. I wish someone would just make a map for me. What should I care about? Who should I vote for? What are the issues that are affecting me, and how do I find a way to get a grasp on them. And so, well, Lenny Letter has plenty of, you know, articles about nail care and the kind of, you know, uh, the kind of goofier sides of reproductive health and plenty of, you know, stuff to satisfy an audience that may want to be amused and a little bit titillated. A huge focus for us is highlighting politicians who, many female politicians, um, pro-choice, who care about reproductive justice, who care about the Black Lives Matter movement, who care about the issues that are the most important to our readers, and really letting millennial women into the lives of these politicians. So doing a new, more intimate kind of interview with anyone from Lucy Flores to Donna Edwards, women who are changing the conversation in the country and who these girls may not find out about, you know, may not go deep enough into the times to find out about it, because I know that I didn't. And mm -hmm. so that's been, it's been really amazing to see so many young women engage with the political process when given the tools to do so. And that was a huge impetus for us in starting the newsletter. And every time we get a tweet or an Instagram that says, hey, today I, you know, today I, went out and rallied for this particular politician or I think I'm going to vote in the primary this year, we know that it was worth it to, That's awesome. to begin. That's great. Julianne, do you want to talk a little bit about aligning yourself with Everytown USA? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, actually, it was a, a media moment that sort of led me to it. It was interesting. I've been very affected, obviously, by um, by the experiencing gun violence in our in our culture, but I was affected as a as a citizen, as a parent, and it was something that I was, I would talk about and I kind of would lament about and I would tweet about it. And I was doing an article for the Hollywood Reporter last year, it was a cover story, and it was just about my career and my experiences and what I was interested in artistically and you know, blah, blah, blah. And at the very end of the article, um, he asked me, the, the, the writer asked me, did I get a lot of blowback on Twitter about being pro-choice? I said, actually, no, I didn't. I got most of my blowback about gun safety. And my quote was, I don't understand how um, gun safety somehow threatens the Second Amendment. So, which I felt was a pretty salient point and, and not at all inflammatory. And they ran a headline that said, Julianne Moore does not believe in guns. And I was like, wow. <laughs> wow. I'm feeling for your agent right now. Yeah, yeah. I was like, how does this happen? How did something that was, that was really, really meant to be kind of a practical and a common sense comment turn into clickbait? Right. So I said, well, what can I do about this? And I feel like there are so many people that were running from the issue of gun safety and gun violence because of the blowback they were getting, because of those kind of headlines, because suddenly somebody who were saying, like, this is, this is unconstitutional, you know, this is against the Second Amendment, um, you know, people are trying to take away guns. And I'm like, that's not the point at all. Right. So I wanted to change the culture around talking about guns. I want to talk about common sense. I want to shape the gun industry like the car industry you know that was a very dangerous machine that was invented and people were it was you know there were 
tremendous fatalities. And slowly, with different kinds of legislation, with seat belts and airbags and, and Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, and, and we changed the culture around driving. Mm -hmm. And then that automobile became slightly less dangerous. Why can't we do the same with guns? So, so I thought, okay, I know that actors are reluctant to talk about this because of that blowback. Yes. But how can I align myself with an organization that I admire and really begin to kind of get out there? So I, I went through my contacts on my computer and just literally went through them, said, hey, I'm doing this thing. You don't have to do much, but this is really about safety. And I was also using marriage equality as an example that we're going to go state by state by state and really slowly change hopefully uh, laws and, and awareness, and people signed up. Because, because I felt like it, it's, we are ready to do something. I mean, the president has actually taken amazing action just recently and, and really has talked about how do we make it less possible for dangerous individuals to have guns. Not, you know, right. this is not something that's anti-constitution, you know. So, so, that, so that's, that's why I feel like I was able to gather people around me because it really was about common sense and not about, um, I don't know, starting a, you know, starting a Twitter war. <laughs> okay, stay away from the Twitter wars. We're gonna talk about that. Okay, Lena, you've written a lot of inspiring articles that empowered women everywhere. Tell us about why sharing your personal story. You get extremely personal. Um, why is that important to you know, engaging a reader? Because we all in the media know personal is better, but maybe you're even out on the front line of personal. Well, I think the old adage, the personal is political, is, has never been more true. And the fact is, is that people need to feel a connection to an issue in order to take action. And I think that one of the things that's so amazing about watching that Let Girls Learn video that you just showed is that you're not just talking about it, we're seeing these girls and seeing the joy on their faces and seeing what happens when you put young women in the way of education. And so an example is um, that I have, I suffer from endometriosis, which is a, oh. an illness that many women have in the United States and that is highly under, women's health in general is highly under-researched and highly underfunded and many doctors are ignorant about its effects and it's easy to write a piece with statistics, you know, the, the massive gap between how we research diabetes and how we research women's health, the massive gap between how we research men with heart attacks and how we research women's health. And well, I don't have my sheet in front of me, it's, a, it's an alarming gap in um, the way we examine those issues. And so I could have gone on Lenny and just talked about the specifics of the statistics and the lack of funding, but what felt to me both personally gratifying and more effective was to talk about what I had been through in the 10 years before my diagnosis. And the outpouring of support and also the outpouring of um, questions and interest in how can we be helpful and how can we change the conversation around this illness so that women feel less alone and feel less cared for was remarkable. And I don't believe I would have gotten that result if I hadn't sort of taken the chance and shared some details that were really painful and what some might consider TMI because it does <laughs> deal with a very specific part of your body. Um, and it was amazing. And since then, just on Instagram and Twitter, I've seen the conversation flourish. I've seen pieces in The Guardian about endometriosis, long re investigative pieces on why are we dealing with women's health the way that we are. And so I think that when you allow people into your story, um, it resonates with them in a new way and they want to take the issue on in a way that they wouldn't when they were just presented with numbers. Along that line, Mrs. Obama, I was going to ask you about, let, girls' education is such a personal topic for you, so in a very similar way, how does putting your story out there connect you to the girls? You know, we, uh, when you're the first lady or you're an actress or you're larger than life to many girls, you know, living in poor communities, living in urban cities, not just here in the United States, but around the world, you seem untouchable. They, they look at you and they think there's no way I could be her. Um, there's no way I could do that because there must have been some magic in her life, some luck, some charm. She must have a special potion that's going on. Um, and for me, it is so important for kids in particular to understand that I am them, they are me, you know, um, that I was in their shoes literally 
and that if I can be sitting up here, a, a Princeton, Harvard educated first lady of the United States having run nonprofit organizations and practice law and worked as a vice president of an academic medical institution and blah, 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 you can do it too. Um, but you don't get that if all they see is Michelle Obama, the first lady. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's too untouchable. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel it's so important to connect to these kids so that they can see themselves in me, mm -hmm. so that they push all that, that, that impossibility out of their heads. And you know, they replace that with the notion that with hard work and investment, and dedication that they can achieve. Um, now it's not as easy for girls in, in countries that don't invest in their education, um, but it's still not impossible. Uh, and, and we have to be those role models for them, but in order to do that, we have to be vulnerable and we have to tell our stories in an honest and authentic way. Um, and you can't do that if you're trying to be something that you're not, if you're not willing to connect and share and um, you know, talk about your own fears and missteps. Um, it makes us more human. And so they think that they can be sitting here too when they can. So I, I think it's just essential. So Julianne, talk about a quote that you had, which was really wonderful. What you gain as an actor is a sense of, sense of empathy. You're trying to put yourself in someone's shoes and see what that feels like. Now, all actors do this, but not all of them take on the issues that you take on. So what are the moral and ethical obligations of being an entertainer today? That's an interesting question. I was listening to NPR the other day. Um, I was driving uptown to get my daughter, and there was this scientist um, uh, being interviewed and talking about medical research and and how you know and the ethics of medical research and, and how do you participate in it. And one of the things that she said that really touched me was that that as human beings we have a social contract with one another. You know that's what allows us to live with one another. That's what allows you to stop at a red light to um, know that you should uh, you know, give somebody a hand when they've fallen down, to, 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 to do research into disease. You know? And I do believe that it's the same with the arts. It sounds, um, I'm not to be kind of highfalutin about it or anything like that, but I do think that you enter into it because you're trying to figure out, first of all, who you are and who everybody else is. And, and when I talk to young people about what drew me to acting, I always say it was reading first. It's not that I had an instinct to be a performer. I don't actually innately like that, but I like story. I like narrative because that's how I learned about the world. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the thing, and thing too, when I was younger, when I was a kid, I would read a book and say, well, how do they know that about me? <laughs> you know, and then I realized, well, it was about them. But what, 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 you know, the universal was what was connecting us. So when I found a way to do that in my work, it was utterly thrilling. And the, and the best thing that I, um, the best compliment I, uh, I've received is when somebody said, you know, that was me, that was my story. So that's what you're always trying to do with your work is to figure out where you and this character and the audience connects because you're trying to, the audience comes to see themselves. They don't come to see you. They come to see their hopes and dreams and, and feelings uh, reflected. Um, so, so that to me is the most exciting thing. And then in terms of, you know, when you're talking about telling a personal story with, with, um, with charities as well, and, and, and what magazines allow you to do when they do ask you something personal is to, is to reveal that and to say, this is, this is who I am, and this is why I care, and it's reflected in my work, and, I, and even with an issue like you know, gun violence or gun safety, I feel like I'm very representative of my audience. I'm a woman with children who works, who cares about these things, cares about their children's safety, and I say, this is what I was doing when Newtown happened. Like, what were you doing? And everyone's like, oh yeah, you know? So, so once again, it's about entering, so th that idea of entering into that social contract in your work and in your life and in your relationships is, is kind of an exciting and validating way mm. to be alive. Though I will tell you as an editor and a lot of editors out here know that sometimes when you ask a celebrity to get personal, they're like, ah, they run away from personal. So that's fantastic that you actually put the two together, which is great. So let's talk about um, you know, using media strategically and successfully. And I'm gonna start with Mrs. Obama. And I've covered a lot of first ladies. 
and usually they want to keep a distance between them and the audience, between them, you know, they want to be out there carefully taken care of and, and, and in the little bubble, but not too much, don't get too close. So you have done so many kinds of media and you are reaching out directly, you're reaching out through all social media. What is it that you, what made you decide to engage so directly and what have you learned so far? Because you've really leapt, you've leapt right into American lives. Well, I, I think it's just the sign of the times. I mean, if you think about um, what, how different the media climate was in, you know, 2008 when we were campaigning before we even came into office. I mean, if you think about it, there, there was no Twitter, there was no Snapchat. That, we didn't even have iPhones. We still you use still have blackberries, blackberries in the White House. We're, I think yeah, so. We're still hanging on our blackberries. Okay. We love our blackberries. But I have an iPhone, so I'm trying to hang in there with the times. Um, but things have really changed, you know. Um, so as a result, you know, if, we, if, if you want to communicate and be effective in communicating your, your message, these days you really have to be nimble and you have to be willing to take some risks and try new things um, and engage on, on platforms that you might normally not have before because things are so different today. Um, you know, I was t talking to my staff when we were just talking about this topic and, you know, I said, look, if Eleanor Roosevelt were alive today, I'm sure she would have a Twitter account and maybe in addition to her radio program, <laughs> but she would have a Twitter account because that's how you communicate these days. So I don't know that I'm doing anything groundbreaking. I, I'm pretty sure that the next administration, the next first spouse, um, if, if they want to be effective in communicating their message. Oh, you caught that? Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm just being uh -oh. neutral because, you know, the world is big. And, and interesting. <laughs> but the next first spouse is going to have to figure out how to, you know, connect with the audiences they're trying to connect with. And who knows what the, 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 the new platforms will be uh, in the years to come. Uh, you know, there's Vine now. I mean, I still, my mind is blown by Vine when my staff tells me, you have six seconds. I'm like, to do what? <laughs> What do you expect me to do in six seconds? Don't ask that question of certain people. Right. But I do it, and it right. works. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, you, you have to be flexible in, in this uh, current social media climate. And so I'm just, you know, I, I want to make sure that the issues that I take on really move the needle. I think that's ultimately my goal. I mean, I don't want to do something just for the sake of doing it. I don't want to have initiatives that are just slogans. You know, it's important, for example, with Let Girls Learn that we actually change the culture around the world about how we educate our girls. So it makes no sense for me to use communication tools that are not reaching the audiences that I need to reach to have that impact. So we have to figure out how those changes are affecting the message every single day. Has anything surprised you about a certain media that you've used in terms of reaching a different audience is anything, you know, when you use Instagram or you use Snapchat or you use, I mean, are, and are you, how are you positioning each one of those things differently? I mean, we well, know why you did a magazine. Yeah, yeah, I, I'm, I'm different. I mean, I'm always surprised when young people tweet so freely. <laughs> and I'm just, gosh, you guys really should think about this stuff. It's like, do you, you know, let me talk to the young people sitting right here. Okay, you guys be careful with social media. I mean, before I take tweet, it for me, you got to be careful. Yeah, yeah be careful. <laughs> We're gonna bring that up. And I'm surprised at how not careful people are. Um, when when I tweet, you know, I'm really thinking about what I say, and I got three people looking at it, and we're like, well, what does that word? What is that gonna communicate? And you know, the notion that people are just throwing out their, you know, their statements is sometimes surprising. Um, but one of the things we talk about with young people is that, you know. You got to be careful when you use social media and know that when you put something out in the world, it lasts and you can't really take it back that easily. So you have to be responsible and, you know, and that, you know, that goes to bullying and, you know, all that stuff that you think is cute when it's just in the classroom and then you put it out there and it lasts forever and it can have that kind of impact. So we try to spend a lot of time 
talking to kids about you know just the dangers and the challenges but I'm, I'm still surprised at how freely people are willing to to put stuff out there and I consider myself pretty open um, but we still are very thoughtful about what we do and what we say um, and rarely do you hear me just as my husband would say pop off on <laughs> I don't just pop off on social media. I really try to be thoughtful and make sure that what we're saying is actually, as I said before, going to move the needle in a positive way. All right, Lena, you're up talking about popping pop off, off on social media. I know, media. Lena, it's popping off. It's, which is, which, you know what, I mean, that's a great term for it. Sometimes popping off can be exciting because it starts a conversation and there's an immediacy to it and, there's, and people can feel your passion and they join you. And sometimes it's a giant mistake and it's been a real education for me in the five years that I've been working to really, in the five, I had a Twitter account before anybody knew who I was and I, you know, I went back and I erased some things, but because I dread- Can you erase? I didn't know you can erase. Oh yeah, you can delete a tweet. Oh, okay. Take it from me, you can delete a tweet. All right, but okay. I think I, if you're a celebrity, I don't know if the average person- Oh, yeah. we all have that power. All right, and okay. you can edit an Instagram caption, never forget. But all right. I, I think it's really important. As you said, you know, I really do often see young women's presence online and think like, you're gonna, in three years, you're going to regret not just less the way you were representing yourself than the way that you were interacting with other people. And I actually had a funny experience this year. I was following a, a friend's daughter on Instagram and there were a lot of, and I knew that she was letting me follow her, but she wasn't letting her father follow her. Ooh. And there were some posts uh -oh. that I found a little risque and she's 15. And so I really debated doing this. You know, you never want to interfere with how anyone's raising their child, but I sent him an email and I said, I think you should just check it out. It's a little um, sensual, if you will. <laughs> I'm a little stressed about it. And then he wrote me back and he said, I checked with her and she says it's art. Oh, and I was like, okay, all right. well, if you're going to be, I mean, you know, I think I was like, I did my job. My job here is done. <laughs> I can take no more action. But I do think, you know, it's not, people often say, what will you do later when someone looks you up for a job interview? What will you do when, you know, you're being, you, you know, you want a job in the CIA and you're being checked out? And I think the bigger issue is what follows you around personally, because I will often, sometimes if someone writes me, um, something hostile I'll, on Twitter, which I look at less than I used to, I'll go to their account and I'll realize they're a 14 or 15 year old kid. Oh, and wow. they're not just dealing with me that way, they're dealing with their classmates that way. They're approaching the world with a level of hostility and anger because of the, the veil of secrecy that the internet allows for. And I just think about the way that that, interacting with people that way will follow you into your life and it won't just have negative consequences for can you get a job or can you, you know, can you, make a living, but negative consequences for you emotionally. And I've had to be really careful because I think, you know, Julianne's learned through her work talking about gun safety. These are very hot button topics for people and you have to walk the line between expressing yourself honestly and protecting yourself because there are a lot of people who have, there are a lot of people on the internet who have dangerous mentalities. Julianne, do you have anything about, I mean, do you, are there any medias that you like to use better for certain reasons, or how well, do you control it? I think it's interesting what, what they were saying about, about it, it's short form that, that actually I feel is pretty dangerous sometimes because you're not allowed to express a complicated idea. Uh -huh. So I think it's interesting when you're talking to a room full of people who work in media where there have been these giant changes where, where people were able to express themselves in essay forms or articles or, or you, put, you put a finer point on something, but this idea that something's going to come out, it's going to be pithy, and it's going to encapsulate an issue one way or another, I think is inherently difficult, you know, because life, you know, issues aren't that way. So it's not yes or no, it's not black or white, it's not, um, I think, you know, all this, I think this, you're an idiot, you know, that's where I find, um, that's where I want to slow the conversation down and say, like, let's, let's really talk about this and that, let's not make everything so so black and white all the time and that's what I'm and that and that is pervading our culture it's coming from it comes from the internet and it's turned in, you know we see it in television and we see it in, in uh, other forms of, of media too and so I'm tr I'm really trying to fight against that but I don't know I mean I don't know how 
and people <laughs> having 140 character opinions about things that they haven't actually read. Like, I'm yeah. sure plenty of people had plenty of things to say about your Hollywood Reporter interview without engaging with the fullness of right. your idea about what right. would be an appropriate approach yeah, to the Yeah, or the idea, of, you, know, you know, the idea wasn't articulated even in the article because it was just a one, you know, it was a one question thing at the end. But that was, a, that was an issue. We were talking about this backstage. I had an interview with a young woman who kept asking me, it was for a women's magazine, and she was asking me a lot of sort of hot button political questions. And I kept stonewalling her, and I finally, and she said, do you, are you uncomfortable with this line of questioning? I said, I said, I do not feel comfortable with how this is going to be expressed in this format. I said, I don't know that these quotes aren't going to be just taken out of context and just made into a headline. And I said, I would like to be able to speak eloquently um, and, and um, authentically about this, but I don't know what the format is allowing. And so you don't want it to be just like, oh, headline, you know. Well, that's why you all have to edit a magazine, <laughs> because that it's yours, and it's a document, and right. it, yeah. you know, and it doesn't come and go. So everyone, right, right. edit a magazine. Edit a magazine. Edit a magazine. Have an opportunity to do yeah. that. I highly recommend it. Lena, can you just, do you want to talk at all about the Instagram, that you were on Instagram for a while, and then you posted a picture, and did it go kooky? Is that what I heard? Did something happen with an Instagram picture? Because a <laughs> lot happened maybe with Twitter. Not. I mean, maybe Was you're referring Twitter? to the fact that I've been fairly public about the fact that I no longer check my own Twitter. Because uh -huh. I found that the hostility, particularly the hostility towards women and the expressions of violence were too yeah. much. And it's something that I've been very open about because I think Twitter is an important platform. But I think that they, as well as many media platforms, many internet media platforms, social media platforms, have to be putting more barriers in place for what is ultimately the violent harassment of women. And just because it's not face-to-face -face doesn't mean it's not extremely dangerous emotionally, doesn't mean it couldn't transfer into something really um, kind of terrifying in the real world. And so I stopped checking my, I started using a, a social media manager, which I know is just sort of supposed to be the wizard behind the curtain, but I wanted to be open about that to say, hey, you may think that I have a you know fancy celebrity life where I'm hidden from this kind of thing, but I too am experiencing violent bullying on the internet, and it affects me also. And right. I think that until new ki new codes of conduct are in place, um, I'm not going to be able to return to looking at that platform freely. Yeah, and you know, and back to the social contract thing too. The thing about our social contract is that it is public. So it's interesting to me that we've developed this this weird form of communication where people are not public with their names or yeah. their persons. And and that I think is dangerous. And I wish yes. that there were a way for people to claim their presence on social media so that it's so that they reveal themselves. Because I I, I do think that that's um, uh, not great for us culturally to have that kind of... Yeah, I think the anonymity is what the problem is. And I think it's important to remember that threats are more than just a, something, someone saying, I'm going to come to my hou your house and I'm going to hurt you. Insulting someone's appearance, insulting right. someone's religion or their race, you know, all of that to me constitutes a threat. And I, I think we can make changes to how we control that dialogue on the internet without threatening our First Amendment rights. So let's talk a little bit about humor, because you guys all have a great sense of humor. I've seen her on I've Fallon. I've seen her with She's Big Bird. She's pretty good. I've seen her on, on TV on all kinds of things. So let's start with Mrs. Obama, because you are not afraid of doing your humor at all. So how do you think that's gotten your message across, and, and why is it so effective, especially also for Let Girls Learn and, and all your different programs that you have here? Yeah, it, humor is an equalizer, and it, you know, it, it sort of reduces the, 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 the tension or the, you know, it just eases um, the message, and it's fun, you know? I mean, when, when I look at my girls and what they share, it's usually something funny. Mm. You know, that's how you catch them. You know, you catch them with a laugh or you know, something highly embarrassing or stupid. Mm. It's one or the other. But that's what's going to pull them in. And again, you know, the goal is to be effective and get the message across. So it mean, if it means that I got a rap on the South Lawn, <laughs> okay, I can do that. That's fun. Uh, and what happens is that, you know, it's that funny thing, oh my God, the first lady's dancing with a turnip, you know. <laughs> a lot of dancing you know? in these videos. Turn up for what, you know, okay. that's, what, that's my staff. They're like, make her dance again. <laughs> now we're gonna rap. It's like, okay, really? Um, but <laughs> but it, it, it 
captures the attention and then behind the humor is hopefully a message or a call to action or you know maybe if uh, you know a kid sings go to college and get some knowledge a few times it'll actually sink in and they'll think oh maybe I'll go to college so it's it, humor is a hook um, and it's also a way to once again become a little more relatable you know when we talk about let, let's move for example just to talk briefly about another issue you know, we, we really want to make it less intimidating, exercise and movement. So let's think about making it fun. You know, parents, you can get up and dance with your kids. It doesn't have to be serious. Um, you know, healthy living can be fun. Uh, so, you know, we just, you know, we're, we're, we're just trying to connect um, and have a little fun ourselves in, in the meantime. There's nothing wrong with having a little fun. Right. How do you guys use humor, Julianne and Lena? Is there anything that you, anything you regret, or anything you wish you'd done more humorously? No, no? never. I mean, honestly, well, I realize no I regrets kind of, at I, all. I, yeah, no regrets. Um, I, I, uh, somebody. I, I, I look back at my body of work, though, and I think, like, geez, I seem so serious. I realize I probably do more dramas, but I watch more comedy. Oh, so I am, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm more affected by that, and I'm drawn in by it, and, and I look for it everywhere. And I'm, I'm actually not very serious when I'm working, even on a set. I'm, you know, I'm not a serious person, and I'm serious about my work, but, you know. Um, but you're not, like, <laughs> Daniel day Lewising it between, you're not staying in oh, character no, no, between no. takes. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> um, but I think that that's what makes the world go round. That's how we connect. That's how we display our intelligence. That's how we try to impress someone. We tell a joke, you know. Um, I think Lena is a master at comedy. I mean, truly, truly. I mean, I, lo I love comedy both because it's fun and also because it, as you said, has the um, has the ability to push the needle forward on issues. And often a joke will stick with you in a remarkable way until, as you said, the issue is really kind of embedded in you. And there's no jokes that I've made in my, in my work as a writer, a director, a performer that I regret. I would say the only jokes I've made that I regret have been on social media because of wow. that. Because of the fact that there's this immediacy where you're like, oh, I'm just going to throw it out there. And you forget that you're joking about something that's serious. Whereas when I'm making my show, I have a lot of time to really, you know, I write the joke, I say the joke, I edit the joke, and I have time to make sure that I'm really standing behind what I've put into the world. Where there have been a couple times, one time some guy said to me, like, why, in a snarky way on Twitter, why are you naked? Like, please, for the love of God, why are you naked so much on your show? And I was sitting in a hotel room at, like, one in the morning. I just posted SNL the night before. I was exhausted, and I wrote back, gee, mister, I don't know, ask my uncle. And suddenly I was like, <laughs> why did I do that? <laughs> oh, no. Why did I do that? Lena. It was really Lena. bad. And then, of course, because I'm such a people pleaser, I apologize like 72 times to the point where everyone was like, shut up. We're fine with it. Just go away. And yeah, go to bed. And so I think that's another reason my social media manager is helpful, because she'll be like, you want to think about this one for 10 minutes? And I'm like, thank you for stopping me. Oh my goodness, oh, the late night, the late night tweet. So in our last few minutes here, um, well, I would like to hear from Mrs. Obama, what's the next phase for Let Girls Learn? And how can the rest of us help you here today to get the word out? Obviously, the media companies are helping, but oh, yeah, and what I, else I, can we do for you? I just you? want to thank the media companies for stepping up in a big way. I mean, I think you, um, uh, laid out we're you know working closely with the Peace Corps and we're developing a fund right now we've raised over a million dollars and it's funding many many projects uh, run by Peace Corps volunteers on the ground uh, there's so many opportunities uh, to to engage so we hope that all of you find a way to get involved um, this is going to be an issue that I, I'm going to uh, tackle for a very long time you know when we leave office in a year as Barack and I say, we'll still be young. We'll still oh have yeah, some, you we kidding? still got some life in us. Um, so we're, you know, in the process of thinking through how do we best use the next phase, the next platform that we have to continue to impact the issues that we care about. And one of the things I learned coming into the office at First Lady, the thing everybody asked before Barack had won a primary or done anything was, "What's your platform going to be as First Lady?" And I was like, "Really." You know, I, I don't even know what that platform is going to feel like, so I can't answer that question. I don't know what that role is going to be, and I feel the same way about the next phase of life and what I'm going to do. I don't know what it will feel like to be the former first lady, and 
what power or voice I will have and how to best use that effectively, I'll know better when I'm there. But I know that girls' education, educating our kids here in the United States, making sure that they make the most of their education, they take their education seriously, that they invest in themselves, they push themselves, you know, and that we do that for kids all around the globe. That is gonna be something that I'm gonna be working on for the rest of my life um, because I think about my girls when I think about girls' education. I think about the potential that all of these young women have and what a waste it would be if we didn't capitalize on it and if they didn't capitalize on it. And that's not a message that, you know, that's not a problem that's gonna get solved in a few years or possibly not even in a generation. And we're gonna need to keep pushing hard on this issue to change cultural norms around the world, to demand that countries invest in their girls as much as they invest in their boys. And we want to make sure that kids here continue to be inspired by the stories of these girls. I mean, there are girls around the world who are putting their lives at risk to get an education. Malala Yousafzai, um, I could go on, that girls in Nigeria risking kidnap just to get an education. So we don't have the luxury of squandering the education that we have, and I want our kids to be just as passionate and just as hungry to do what they can to make the most of their education. So that's something we're gonna be talking about for a long time to come. I don't know, that's kind of a long answer, but. <laughs> and Julianne. And what's, ne what's next for your? for your project, and then Lena, well, just tell I, us. I think in terms of the, the Creative Council for, for Every Town, we just want to be part of the change. You know, we, we don't expect it to be fast. We Like I said, our, our model is, is marriage equality. We want to go state by state. We'd like to see universal background checks. I'd like to see a lockbox in every house that has a kid in it. It also has a gun. Um, I think we just want to take steps to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people. And it will be slow and probably a little bit boring, but it will get done. I really do believe it'll get done. Great, Lena. Um, well, our goal at Lenny is to um, continue to expand and to move into other countries and both translate our content and make content that's specific to those new locales so that it can be a resource for women about issues in the not just in the US, because the issues that a woman is facing in the Middle East, the issues that a woman is facing in Brazil are very different than the issues that we're facing here in the United States. And so while some content can be universal, other content has to be specific. And the internet can often be the safest and most private place for women to learn and to gain resources. And so it would be a real dream to be able to continue that conversation, um, not just with American feminists, but with global feminists. Great, and with that, thank you all for being here today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hallelujah. Girl said you hallelujah.